about the set about the set situation in Russia and Ukraine. Well, in Ukraine. <laughs> And so that's what we were all talking about, how, because we do have, I don't know if everybody knows, but we have an upcoming big Congress in St. Petersburg that was supposed to take place in May. And of course, um, we're saying that, you know, uh, that the anthropologists in the world represented by WOW uh, should take a stand and, you know, uh, show how this is really outrageous, uh, what is happening in that region. Anyway, so back to our, issue here today. So um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, as you know, we are here now in the WCA webinar, a World Council of Anthropological Associations. My name is Clara Saraiva. I'm the president of the Portuguese Anthropological Association and also part of the organizing committee, basically the board of WCA. Now, WCA is part of WAL. World Anthropological Union, together with IUAES, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. And we organize, we've been organizing this webinar since March 2020, when um, the pandemic hit us all and um, everything started happening online. In 2020, the webinars happened every month. Uh, this year, uh, in 2021, and this year, we've been having them basically every two months. They are all available in the WCA-WOW website. So they've been recorded and they are available there if you want to watch previous webinars or if you cannot attend uh, today's webinar um, or, or if you cannot attend part of it, you will always be able to retrieve it and watch it online. So this webinar will be recorded, as was already mentioned. Uh, is, it will be also online. It will be transmitted through various um, means, Facebook, YouTube, etc. And I want to thank here to Michelle Bouchard, our colleague from the University of Northern British Columbia, who is the host, the technical host of this webinar, and Ricardo Faguaga from Mexico, who is our technical uh, dash um, digital uh, experts, which I'm not at all, I must say. So, and of course, I want to very specially thank to our guests today. Uh, for every webinar we choose and we, we basically invite people who are experts um, on, on the various issues, the various themes that the webinars um, try to develop and, um, and, and, and provocate some debate. So today we have an exceptional uh, list of colleagues, um, always based on uh, national diversity. And I'm going to be presenting everyone starting as always from the East to the West, um, basically because in the East it's probably already 11 or 10 PM. So I suppose our colleague from China must be almost falling asleep, whereas Michelle, in uh, Northern British Columbia is just waking up. So but that's life. That's the bad and good things about Zoom. So uh, the participants today will be um, our colleague, and I apologize in advance if I don't say all your names the correct way. Please do correct me if I don't. So Lin Nakano from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And then we will have Sandra Manuel from the University of Eduardo Mondlane, Maputo, Mozambique. Then Salome Bucacci. Well, Bucacci would be said in an Italian name. I don't know if it's Bucacci or Bucacchi, University of Nairobi in Kenya. Then we'll have Miguel Valdalmeida from the University Institute of Lisbon, Ixcate, in Lisbon, Portugal. Then we'll have Miriam Grossi from uh, Brazil, University, uh, Uni Federal University of Santa Catarina in Southern Brazil. And then last but not least, Homa Hutfar. Who's, who is from Iran originally, has been a professor at the Concordia University in Canada. So I will now very briefly present our guests and then I will give them the floor. Basically the way this webinars run, uh, in case you have, you're not acquainted with the format, it's a very informal uh, debate. It's uh, like I said, open to everyone since it's been transmitted through, through several, um, social networks and uh, various media. And uh, people are then after our 
our guests talk, uh, people are, of course, invited to participate via the chat or even in the end, if they want to ask questions alive <laughs> talking. We always ask people to please write down their names and their um, the country or the institution they come from when they write on the chat so that, that we have a minimal uh, idea where people come from. Since this, this is the World Anthropological Association, we really want and like people from all different regions of the world to participate. Uh, so we will have, first of all, Lin Nakano from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Aline is professor of Japanese studies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and she's the author of Community Volunteers in Japan, Everyday Stories of Social Change, but also Making Our Own Destiny, Single Women, Opportunity and Family in Shanghai, Hong Kong and Tokyo. And these books are on single women on Sh in, in Shanghai, Tokyo and Hong Kong and their struggles against patriarchy. Her research focuses mainly on people whose life choices and experiences fall out of the mainstream. And she is actually conducting research on special education in Japan. Then afterwards, we will have Sandra, uh, Sandra Manuel from the University of Eduardo Mondlane in Maputo, Mozambique. She is a social anthropologist, assistant professor at this university and researcher at Kaleidoscopio Research Institute on Culture and Public Policy. She teaches research, research, researches and does policy analysis, analysis focusing on the social analysis of the body, gender, sexuality, and health. Her research questions um, normative gendered notions looking at the intersectionality of gendered relations and understanding social cultural readings of the body and sexuality, specifically in the African context. Her latest journal publication is entitled uh, Performing Respect, Contemporary Strategies and Lived Experiences in Intimate Relationships in Maputo. Salome Bukaki from the University of Nairobi, Kenya is a social and medical anthropologist with over 20 years of experience working on infectious diseases with a focus on community knowledge. She lectures at the, um, and she lectures anthropology at the University of Nairobi and supervises students undertaking research. She also works with various stakeholders, um, both local and international, in understanding research and development on anthropological issues, mainly, uh, namely gender. Miguel Valdameida is my friend and colleague from Lisbon, from the University Institute of Lisbon, ISCTE. He is um, a professor there and he's also a researcher at CRIA, the Center for Research in Anthropology. He has done research in Portugal, Brazil, Spain, and Israel, Palestine, uh, focused on gender and sexuality, as well as on race, ethnicity, and post-colonialism. He has published several books, uh, two of which, which I'll name here, are in English, The Hegemonic Male on Masculinity, and A Nurse Colored Sea on Portuguese colonialism and post-colonialism in Portuguese-speaking countries. Besides other uh, pieces and other books, his latest books um, in Portuguese, or one of his latest books in Portuguese, A Chav do Armário, which should be translated into the the key to the closet, I suppose, is on issues of same-sex marriage and family and aliaha on state and subjectivity among Brazilian Jews in Israel. As an LGBT rights activist, he was a member of the Portuguese parliament, instrumental in the passing of the equal marriage and gender identity laws. Then we will have Miriam Grossi from Universidade Federal Santa Catarina, the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. She is a feminist anthropologist working in gender, sexuality, and history of the women in anthropology. Uh, she's also uh, currently a visiting professor at the Université de Sorbonne Nouvelle in France. And she has published on gender violence, feminist, feminism and queer movements, education, marriage, and LGBT kinship, as well as in the history on the history of anthropology in France and Brazil. She's also a past president of the Brazilian Anthropological Association, and she's currently on the board of the Brazilian Society for the Progress of Science and in the Council of CNPK, which is the National Council, Council of Science and Technology in Brazil. Last but not least, our colleague from Iran, um, who has been a professor of anthropology at Concordia University. She's now an emeritus professor. 
from this university, Concord University of Montréal. Her field-based research and expertise have been on political economy and legal anthropology, focusing on reproductive rights, Afghan women and youth refugees in Iran and Pakistan, women in formal and informal politics, hijab and dress codes as political institutions, gender and citizenship, and gender and the public sphere in Muslim context. Contexts. She has also published a book on Muslim women's sports as politics. And she has also published, well, many other books, uh, amongst them, Sexuality in Muslim Contexts, Restrictions and Resistance, or Electoral Politics, Making uh, Quotas for Women, and also another one entitled The Muslim Veil in North America, Issues and Debates. Well, this is just a few. Uh, of course, the bios of all these people, of all these colleagues are long ones, but I've just presented the core of their um, bio notes so that you have an idea who they are and where they come from, although they are probably known by everyone. So having said all this, I thank you all, um, everyone for being here, especially our guest speakers. I am going to ask you, as I told you in the mails, in the many mails I send you, in numerous mails I sent you, to please keep it short. Uh, I always ask people to please talk up to five minutes. We, we make the first round, then we have a second round, and then we open to the to everyone, to, to the chat and to questions. And otherwise, it's, it's impossible to do because there's always a lot of people also um, following this through Facebook and, and through YouTube, etc. And we want to keep the discussion lively. And uh, normally, the webinar lasts one and a half hour, two hour tops, otherwise it's too long. And so that's it, we'll start. This time, sometimes we have specific questions. This time, we purposely left it open because gender is such a wide gender and anthropology or anthropology and gender is such a wide issue that I, I, I thought that I would prefer that each one of our guest um, speakers picks it up from the angle they prefer. And so I will first give the word to our far eastmost colleague, Lynn Nakano, thanking you very much once again for being here, please. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to join today's um, discussion. I'm really interested to hear what my colleagues have to say as well. So I thought I would talk about what anthropologists of Japan and China have been discussing recently when they talk about gender in their publications and in, in discussions. So I think it's a curious mix of hope as well as great discouragement when they're looking at the situation of gender in Japan and China. Because on one hand, it seems like there's unprecedented freedoms and allowance for individuals to choose their various issues about their gender or sexual, sexual orientation. It seems like there's so many freedoms now, personal freedoms. At the same time, there's enormous discouragement because when we look at the data, we can see that women are actually in some sense retreating from the workforce in the past 10 years in both China and Japan. So in China, it's an actual retreat from the workforce, particularly among women with, with children. And in Japan, it's a retreat in that women are working, but they are retreating from good jobs that increasingly they're working in part-time, lower paid work. So the societies now have become extremely wealthy. Women are highly educated. So anthropologists are sort of scratching their heads saying, well, what is going on? Why, why is the situation um, on one hand looking better, but for others, it looks much, much worse. It, it doesn't seem to make sense. So in understanding this situation, I think their anthropologists have looked at two basic things. One is the state. So you might not think that in Japan, the state is so involved in people's personal lives, but anthropologists of Japan looking at gender, they do look at the state as having an important role in shaping women's roles in various ways from the tax system and other measures. And in China, of course, the state on the one hand is um, encouraging greater personal freedoms, 
But on the other hand, it's adopting systems where the family has become even more important than before in providing um, care service roles, which means women need to provide those roles. So it's a combination of state policy as well as new neoliberal welfare policies that rely on women and the family to provide these services. I think um, anthropologists also are also looking at the growth of individualism and linking it with neoliberalism and explaining why there seems to be greater personal freedoms and finding, finding evidence in the ways that women are um, delaying marriage, are asking for divorce, are divorcing in larger numbers, and in the way that both men and women seem to have more, more choices regarding sexuality and life choices in general. But at the same time, for, even though there's a growing interest in sexual minorities in, 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 and greater sort of acceptance of sexual minorities in both societies, particularly among young people, we can see that within families, there is not much change or even growing conservatism in some sectors. Um, and so this creates, I think, great conflict and, and struggle with for people, for sexual minorities in families. So to just briefly talk about Japan, anthropologists have been interested in studying areas of family change. So I've mentioned later marriage, longer singlehood, which has been my own work, but others have studied this too. Men in ideal salaryman work, but also in precarious work and what this means for masculinities, growing, rising di divorce, and also studies of men who are in non-conventional roles or who aspire to non-conventional roles, such as um, house husbands are just taking more care of their children than before. And in China, we see that anthropologists are interested in how people are exploring greater freedoms, um, but also how there's more pressure on families to provide caregiving services um, as the state has dismantled social welfare provision, and also how people feel they need to align themselves with nationalist agendas. So their anthropologists have studied um, rural urban migration of both women and men and what this means for them. Also social mobility through education for both women and men and the empowerment of women in families in both rural and urban areas. So I'm about five minutes, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will move on to Sandra, Sandra, Manuel. Hi, uh, everyone. <laughs> I, I, I felt very tempted and um, quite unsure about what to talk about, but I decided to talk about my specific uh, research and what I see in contemporary Mozambique and I guess Southern Africa in general as an interesting dimension uh, between the link of gender and anthropology. Uh, we are going through uh, a large uh, knowledge movement that is calling uh, upon the decolonizing of knowledge, the need to have uh, understandings, concepts that are applicable and relevant to the African context. And anthropology seems to bring such a valuable insight to this uh, perspective that we are now looking for. So, thinking about imagining forms of knowledge production uh, about Africa that change the colonial categories and uh, conventions of academic disciplines uh, in a sense that we produce knowledge that is African-centered, African-based, but globally engaged is the new perspective. And I believe the kind of uh, approach that I'm applying in the research that I do. My research has a specific link between gender and sexuality. So I try to explore how dynamics of post-colonial Mozambique um, in the in, in intersection of uh, capitalism, uh, democracy, uh, urban uh, um, transformation. Uh, and I study specifically those who are well off in society in urban uh, sites in the country how are these combinations shaping the new understandings of what it means to be a man, a woman, what are the different gendered categories in the space. 
And I try to make a specific connection between how sex then helps the definition of uh, your gender category in this context. Um, one of the issues that I face and that relate to some of the authors that are critical about what is happening in sexuality studies and specifically for me to understand how that influences gender dynamics is the recurrent absence of actual sex research. We, it's uh, expanding to uh, sexual politics, the impacts of uh, sexual un understandings of the different concepts, but seems to me that we're exploring less and less of what happens in actual sexual act and how can that be very informative to definitions of gender in my specific case. Just to give you a brief example, I'm now writing an article in which I explore anal fingering, uh, women um, uh, if annually uh, introducing their fingers in men's anuses. And what does it mean in terms of definition of self for those individuals? Uh, how men perceive that practice in a very um, sexist and patriarchal and to a certain extent homophobic context. While one feels pleasure about this sexual act, it's a threatening realization of what it might mean for the individuals practicing such uh, um, act. So I try to explore these challenges, contradictions, these nuances and see how people then relate to each other and relate to the rest of society based on such uh, um, sexual acts. So, uh, I also believe that I reached my five minutes and I'm looking forward to explore more and engage with you all about this topics. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Sandra. Well, actually you still had one minute, but that's fine, no problem. Thank you very much. We will move on to our colleague from Nairobi, Kenya, uh, Salome. Uh, thank you, Clara, and, uh, thank you. for the colleagues that have gone ahead of me and just spoken into the issue of gender. So for me, I look at it from also my research mm -hmm. perspective and also from the academic perspective. And one of the things um, I would bring out is that there is increasing research on the gender issues in various development spaces, be it within the gender-based violence, be it within the health sector, water sector, and several other sectors. So um, my work relates a lot within the health uh, field, uh, being a medical anthropologist uh, by specialization. So, um, so I look at a lot of gender issues within healthcare. The differences between the genders in access to healthcare, the differences in perceptions, who holds the resources to determine who goes where and who has what resources to get the treatment. And also just looking at the aspects of also access to technology. So I combine this also with aspects of, um, of, 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 of nutrition, because we find that also when we look at, especially from our cultural contexts, when we are looking at um, factors that determine allocation of which foods, there's a lot of gender issues, especially from the traditional perspective in relation to who eats what and which parts mm -hmm. of, especially when we're looking at animal source foods, who eats which part of the food. In, in, in traditional communities, uh, women were not allowed, in some communities, women were not allowed to eat um, chicken while men would eat the chicken and the eggs. So there are all those various, um, perceptions around food behavior, perceptions around health behavior. When we come to healthcare, caregiving, and we look at also just the recent uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and how that impacted on the genders differently in relation to access to um, resources to be able to seek treatment, in relation to who is giving the care, um, Whose, whose responsibility is it to give care? And we, we see that many times it's women and the girls who provide the care. 
in a study I did um, in, in, in one of the rural parts of Kenya, where uh, looking at one of the neglected tropical diseases, that is uh, human African trypanosomiasis, my study found that um, when a mother was sick and had to be hospitalized, it's usually either her, her female kin who would be uh, withdrawn from their homes to come and take care of the family or the girls in the home, the daughters of that woman who may mm -hmm. have to drop out of school or to stop schooling for some time to be able to provide care in the home. So we find that healthcare is very gendered. Perceptions around healthcare are gendered. Impacts of, 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 of diseases also have a gendered perception when we look at it, how it impacts on different um, categories of women and different categories of men. So um, uh, from the academia part, we are also looking at aspects of not just application of gender, but also theorizing around uh, gender theories that can help in terms of addressing issues of gender and development. So I stop there, thank you. All right, thank you very much. So we will now move on to our colleague Miguel Valdalmeida from Lisbon. Miguel. Hi. Hello, everyone, and thanks for the invite. Um, this is a very complicated day, you know, for reasons we addressed already, but let's try to go uh, into the, the topic. Um, I, I thought that this would be a good opportunity in a very selfish way, a good opportunity to reflect on what happened in the last 30 years. I mean, I'm not going to go through it all, but in the last 30 years since I actually worked on a more focused manner, on, on masculinity and gender. Um, 30 years ago in the, in the mid 90s, in the early and mid 90s, we were all, um, in terms of anthropology of gender and sexuality, I think we were all working within a framework that still um, considered the, the sex gender opposition, uh, still thought of things in terms of uh, male and female, masculine and feminine, men and women, uh, although we were already challenging those ideas, and we were working with a very um, um, basic um, uh, feminist uh, toolkit uh, 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 in order to, to start to understand what was going on in our societies, especially here in, in Europe, in Southern Europe, but also you know, in the Americas. And, and now, 30 years later, uh, when I look into what my students write, uh, into what people are doing in the social movements with which I'm not as involved now as I used to be. Um, when I see debates and, 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 and uh, uh, even uh, heated discussions around gender and sexuality in society around me, I see a whole lot of new things that happened and they are both um, interesting and productive, but also a little bit scary. And so I'd like to go over a few of them and they're really different uh, among them. Um, we saw the emergence of, of three sets of, of concerns and, 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 and discussions in the last uh, three decades. Uh, the first one was, of course was the emergence and the full blast uh, acceptance of a lot of postmodern and post uh, structuralist approaches um, uh, and also practices, because these two things are very much connected around such names as queer or uh, non-binarism, um, trans, uh, polyamory, uh, gender divergence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of theoretical and practical social movement and also identitary in people's lives, uh, transformations that are very far from what we were doing 30 years ago. And that's something that is challenging me and that I would like to, to note. The second uh, type of, of, of new stuff that emerged in the last uh, three decades was of course, uh, the forms of organized backlash that are extremely well uh, connected and are very effective in a very negative way. Um, for instance, uh, they connect uh, the activity of churches and the theology of some churches with uh, political parties, uh, social movements, media, mass media, and also social media. And I'm talking, of course, about gender ideology, the, the very idea 
uh, of gender ideology has become uh, a huge challenge uh, uh, for us. Uh, and also, uh, uh, this is connected with uh, uh, um, topics such as uh, cultural Marxism and other sorts of accusations, or the notion of gay propaganda. And this is very adequate for today because uh, uh, the sort of offensive that Putin is, 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 is implementing is also an offensive of, of uh, homophobia and sexism because that's part of the ideological composition of, of the present uh, Russian regime. And that's where the notion of gay propaganda was uh, uh, created. And the, the third and last set of new things that have emerged in my lifetime in studying gender and sexuality are um, a lot of uh, practices and conflicts that happen in society that are very ambiguous in themselves and that we need to study them with, with perspective, I think. Uh, I'm talking about movements such as Me Too, for instance. I'm talking about um, um, uh, such things as, uh, for instance, the whole debate around TERFs, uh, uh, around trans-exclusionary feminists, you know, and the, the sort of uh, violent debates that happen in, in some countries. Uh, and this is a, a, a completely new arena of, of, of debate and conflict because it's not a debate between progressive minds that are in favor of gender equality against the backlash uh, of anti-feminism. It's something that happens a lot within uh, uh, the progressive camp, so to speak. I think the turf uh, example is, is, is one that really needs to be studied by anthropologists nowadays. So this is just to say, and I'll finish uh, now, this is just to say that this, this is really a good opportunity, anthropology and gender, to reflect about uh, what's going on now uh, in terms of social debates that is no longer uh, just uh, the type of, of proposition for gender equality that we were dealing with uh, 30 years ago. Right. Thank you very much, Miguel, for this um, very good summary. And we will move on to our colleague from Brazil, Miriam Pilar Grossi. Miriam, thank you. Hi. Thank you very much, Clara and WCA, for this invitation. And uh, well, uh, there is very stimulation round table, uh, all our presentation. Um, I am thinking, oh, I have something to say to, about that and that, but I, I prepare only some, some uh, words about to understand how is the history of our field of research of anthropolo feminist anthropology or gender in anthropology, then I, I think it will be great to discuss a little how these questions arrive in each country that we are talking here. I only talk about Brazil. And to say that in Brazil, it began in the 70s, then we have um, 60 uh, years working on that. And in the 70s, when it began, as in other parts of the world there are, we are in Brazil uh, in a hard moment, the moment where we have, uh, in a way, uh, the feminist and the gay movement began in Brazil in the 70s, but you are in the same moment in a, a very strong di dictatorship. Then it will, will not have the same freedom that in other parts of the world to really have a great movement. But it was in the same moment that in the, the universities, anthropology was beginning as a dis discipline, as uh, the um, formation of anthropology began in the 70s. Then we had something very special in Brazil that all of the professors are very young and are women and gay uh, who are feminists who enter in the university in the 70s. Then. In Brazil, we have a very strong feminist anthropology um, in the 70s and until now, and you are differently from other parts of the world. And for example, here in France, when I, were, I, am, I am now, uh, where these questions only enter in the academy, in the university in the 80s or in the 90s in anthropology, in Brazil, have these discussions in the 70s. Then 
we have a long, very long uh, history of debates and the concepts in the, well in this our field. And another question is uh, that uh, Miguel was talking and other of you is about uh, the relation between gender studies and sexuality that in Brazil uh, it's always the same uh, space of discussion and debate and it, it, it create a, a very important space uh, for not only in the academy but with the movement because we have all the time uh, two ways one a way that is the movement doing all of uh, well many demonstrations but in the university uh, uh, reflecting about that but in the, the other way the movement are very very uh, close to the university we have a lot of the most important activists our pass by in our class are our students then is something that miguel was talking about portugal that you see in brazil uh, this is relation is really very strong uh, only to say that in the, well in this in the 70s it, it begins uh, i will say only some universities in uh, national museum university of campinas sao paulo bahia uh, Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, then, in all these universities, we have uh, feminists, the first generation, uh, as Ruth Cardoso, Eunice Duran, Marisa Correia, Peter Frey, Zaide Machado Neto, Claudia Fonseca, Noemi Brito, Lia Zanotta Machado. They are all anthropologists who, be, who, who study the subject that are now we continue to work on that. For example, the question about violence against women, immigration, women movements, women's work, abortion, different forms of family, all questions about sexuality. And all of these subjects in the 90s, and but more in the 20th century with Lula and Dilma governments uh, are subjects that became uh, strong public policies uh, for women and for all uh, this population. Then we have in the 20th century uh, another relation very important about from anthropology, Brazilian anthropology, but feminist anthropology has a um, space very important with, with the dialogue with the state uh, in the producing public policies for women and for LGBT people and other population. Well, thank you. Okay, Miriam, thank you very much. Um, I will now give the floor to our colleague from Concord University in Iran, Homa, please. Yeah. It's very, very, um, you have to, to either speak closer to the mic or set the sound a bit higher. I hope, how about now, is it more clear? Yeah, it's better, much okay. better. Um, actually, I um, thank you for inviting me, but I was really at a loss about what to say about um, gender, given the areas, um, geographical areas that I work with. Of course, I also belong to the generation that um, um, was very, very really in, in Europe. It was the first generation that discussed gender more seriously in, in terms of academic, because until then it was a women, women versus nat nature, culture, these kind of debate. When, um, but then in, in the Middle East, question of gender became actually very welcoming in the 80s and in the 70s and 80s because then a lot of discrimination against women was actually uh, associated with their femaleness with the body of women and therefore it was hard for women to um, negotiate any kind of um, both cultural change but also legal change because it was all tied with religion culture and laws. Um, so in some way, but with the Iranian revolution, with uh, a lot of changes with the uh, development of Islamists and extremists in terms of right wing, a, a particular form of right wing um, approach to society, things change. So gender 
in fact, well, on the one hand, we have approached, we have reached um, a position of looking at gender as a social role. role. We now talk about gender perf uh, performativity. We, we talk about different sorts of power, uh, especially informal power through normative causes and normative institution. But then we go back to the Middle East, uh, especially these days where with the Taliban back in power uh, and the, the treatments uh, and their view on women and the treatment of women, all these things has come back. Like in the last few years when I have been talking to um, women in Iran and in Pakistan and in, in Afghan uh, Afghanistan, people are talking about so much. It's very impressive the way we have approached gender, but now people talk about genderless societies and all this. But in the process, we have left the women behind. The woman, the body, the female body has been left behind. So much working on gender, but what um, in the context of say Iran and in the context of uh, Afghanistan is not what social role, social role is just so, so tied to the ideology is so tied to the female body is not, um, even though in some way, um, if you look at say what happened, women have been in political position, maybe even earlier than some of the other society we have in Bangladesh, we have had female president for for uh, for very long time now for decades. Uh, we have had uh, prime minister, female prime minister in the ages in Turkey, we have had uh, uh, prime minister, female elected, uh, popularly elected prime minister in Pakistan, um, um, and yet we get we get a situation uh, in like it is in in Afghanistan where women are suddenly banned from even going get, going to the middle school, and is justified because of their femaleness and is justified in not just in the name of law morality but god and so the the battle they have is very different so all these approaches to um gender and on the one hand intellectually is very stimulating but often i hear well these debates is not helping us very much to to resist and what is happening at the same time of course this extremist view about the role of women in society, the God-given role of women in society is also has created a lot of resistance on the part of women. Feminism has become um, a very important role in, uh, in the way women look at the, uh, the society. And then of course, uh, it also now, the, at least in Iran, it plays the role that Marxism did in the 70s, like the enemy, uh, the enemy ideology is actually a feminism that, um, in fact, that was the charges against me when I was arrested. So it's it's so we are we are actually in this situation of of having left a lot of a lot of the population behind in our intellectual debate about gender and gender performativity about genderless society. Last year, um, in in Iran, I had, I read in one of the one of the articles that at least a million women got arrested or given notice or fined because they weren't wearing the hijab completely. Either they showed their hair or they were driving with a, a hijab was in their shoulder. So you can you can appreciate at this point in time when we are talking about gender and and women, things are a little bit confusing. At the same time, very politicized in that context. So. I enjoy and I read the intellectual debates on, on this, but then often it's not very helpful when I'm in the field. So those are, I, um, I'm not going to continue because I don't know how many minutes I, I've been talking, but I just wanted to put a little bit more uh, complexity in the way we intellectually look at gender. Um, and especially when we don't specify it as geographically or contextualize it in that way. And as I say, I hear uh, women say, um, women, women studies, gender studies has left women behind. And we have to maybe, maybe go back and re-examine some of our 
earlier debate, again, in the light of complexities that we see across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Homa. Well, it's actually very interesting to listen to you since you were actually in prison, unfortunately, in Iran, uh, as you said, due to your uh, fight uh, and, and a feminist approach, right? So you are, you could be a subject of our own uh, anthropological analysis since you were yourself subject to those to those uh, anti-feminist ideologies amongst other things. So, well, uh, we've all had the first round of everyone talking and as you all could hear, it's very interesting because each one gave different, a different approach, a different reading of the theme. Of course, some of you spoke about what, is the what are the studies on gender in, in, in your own countries, but some like Miguel gave us a broader view of what we as anthropologists have been doing in the world in the past 30, 40 years concerning gender. And of course, we already have some questions coming up from in the chat, uh, basically concerning uh, issues of uh, how do we define how, why or how we do no longer talk about patriarchy. And, um, and of course, these were, were, I think, terms that anthropology did use uh, in the times of those very strict, almost structuralist, uh, dichotomies of male, female, uh, you know, uh, outside, inside, etc. All the, the things we read about when me and Miguel were students and were written actually in the 60s. But okay, Virginia asks here about the term patriarchy. Why don't we use it or how, how is it used or not? And, and then another question had to do, of course, with um, everybody's talking about the position of women or the under position of women. What about what occurs in the in the same-sex marriage, um, what are the what are the differences there, and especially the, the the scale and the discrepancies in the in unfairness in in um, same-sex marriage? Well, there's more about, of course, heteronormativity, uh, but we can we can also go back to the questions in the chat. I think I will give everyone a second round now, so that perhaps in the second round we can relate what each of you has said or commented on with what other colleagues have said since, like I said, everyone spoke about it from different angles and I totally agree. It's such a wide subject that goes from male, female to, to new conceptions of gender, but also to all the LGBT um, activism. And, um, and also of course, to what we're living today, as Miguel said, and. Um, countries and ideologies that have very strict views of, of gender and of uh, and, and the freedom together with gender. So I will go back to Lean, please. Um, yes, thank you. So I'm listening to my colleagues um, discussion, um, you know, so many things come to mind, but um, one, one thing is that there, there are, you know, global trends that affect East Asia um, you know, the Me Too movement has appeared in, in East Asian societies, um, as well as anti-feminism, anti-Me Too backlash. Um, obviously in China, a strong um, movement from the state, but in the other countries as well, both popularly um, and in, in, different, different in different ways. And I think that's really interesting to, to look at and and to see how that happens differently in the in the different East Asian societies, I think we also see a tendency in in all in the societies that I've been looking at to see a sort of a an increased naturalization of women's roles as attached to their bodies, um, to say that women are made to give birth, especially with the problems of depopulation. Um, low childbirth and so on. Um, in, women are tied to caregiving and to childbirth in, in, in much stronger ways than, than we've seen in recent decades. Um, so I think um, in what, what I'd like to see more is more comparison within East Asia of how various trends appear, especially demographic trends like um, um, decrease birth rate or like I'm looking at um, later marriage, 
greater divorce. I mean, they're happening in really parallel ways throughout the societies, but there's there are very not very many studies that look comparatively at at the different societies within East Asia. And this is because of the probably the biggest problem is language that is just so difficult to be literate in different Asian languages. You need to be literate to do this to do the study properly. So it's difficult to do comparison. Um, but I think there's there can be more um, looking at comparative data. There can be more partnerships among anthropologists looking at similar societies or similar trends. Um, I think sexual minorities are a really good example of, of, of a, a subject that has not that is that is growing interest in, in across the East Asian societies, especially with the growth of sort of convenience marriages where gay men marry lesbian women, and there's sort of a market for this in China and South Korea, but really little comparison of why this is emerging at the same time in both of these societies, but not emerging in Japan as much, where there tends to be adoption instead, um, where lesbian couples will adopt one another as a legal way to have a, a relationship. Um, and I've studied single women in a comparative perspective. I found it's been really useful to understand the ways that the societies are similar in, in addressing um, women's labor within families and also looking at how the ways that societies address women women's labor creates different experiences of singlehood for women and their families that are, that are also quite different and, and distinct. So I, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, well, well, we'll we'll come back after this round because something that I would like to hear about from you is more about well LGBT movements in Japan and China, which I think is something that we are all aware that is not so so easy as in other parts of the world. But we'll go we'll come back to that. Okay, so now we will have um, Sandra. Sandra, you there? Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Um, well. Um... I really enjoyed the, the 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 reading of the that Miguel did of the different periods that we've been living in the understanding of sexuality of gender, sorry, in anthropology. Uh, but it's interesting to notice how context then change, how if location then becomes one global trends influence surely the context where one does research. At the same time, the specificities of the context do not necessarily give visibility to some of the things that are widespread in the global north, for instance, and specifically in Mozambique, uh, issues of um, um, related to non-binary sexualities are indeed an issue, a political issue indeed, but if you have a state and a context that even though it decriminalized sexuality in 2015, still does not give a space for the citizenship to be lived fully in this context. Research then becomes uh, affected by it because it's not necessarily uh, funded, it's not necessarily a space that allows one to uh, do in-depth research. A few years ago, we had, um, uh, with the support from one non-governmental organization, we had a grant for the best thesis that students could do in non-binary sexual, non-normative sexualities. And it was interesting to see the results, but then people feel not stimulated anymore once there's no more kind of support to continue doing this kinds of study. So just wanted to highlight how contexts are differently influenced and dynamics become very localized, very specific. And, but other issues emerge, for instance, there's a continuing of stereotyping or victimization of African women. And those kinds of discourses that have a kind of colonial background are still very much in the forefront of some of the discussions that occur. So too often anthropologists engage in discussing with these um, notions that are dominant in a way, but do not necessarily reflect dynamics of everyday living, everyday life within uh, uh, this, this context. 
Uh, I work a lot on issues of moralities and how people jiggle around with different moralities. As, as some of you spoke about the weight of religion and how that is redefining uh, or, or enforcing more uh, normative, heteronormative uh, forms of understanding sex, gender, and sexuality. And this new movement of churches, uh, evangelical churches, are having a similar effect. And some authors even call them extremist movements, not necessarily military as the Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, terrorism, but in terms of the kind of mindset, the, the, the sociological understanding that they are, are, are ingraining in our society. And they've been here for 10, 20 years. So you now have generations that have been socialized within this uh, uh, perspective uh, and are reformulated so many uh, gains that the movement of gender equality have achieved are now being um, compromised because of new perspectives that are coming into place and that people are now under, um, 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 engaging with uh, or defining themselves into this um, approach. One thing that I also think it's important to reflect on is the context of the development industry. It's um, what is the role of academics, anthropologists in this context that in which we are perceived that countries uh, in, in development. So we need the support in order to get there. And the get there has, the, has a specific understanding of what it means to be developed which too often clashes with local understandings of being an individual, of personhood. And this clashes, but at the same time, for you to get resources to do your research, you have to go under this, the weight of this development industry. So um, even though politically, in terms of policy, some concepts make sense, like uh, early pregnancy or, uh, um, what is marriage, um, premature marriage, contextually, those, those concepts may not make sense. So how do one jiggles around these two dynamics in which one has to uh, respond to this development um, expectations, but at the same time, you have, we have the local dynamics that say something completely different from what is the expectation. So it feels like to, to in a way, it, it, it's a forcing of an evolutionary reading of how society should be that one has to follow. And being an anthropologist, you feel uh, completely constrained by these uh, kinds of perceptions and talking, and, and that also affects the, the studying of gender dynamics in, 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 this, in this context. So, yeah, I had a few more points to, to, to raise, but I think I'll come back in the next round. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, so now back to Salome. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting perspectives from all the panelists. Um, somebody asked about patriarchy, whether that is still not a term that is used. I would like to say that we still use it within our, our, our systems. We still look at patriarchy because when you look at the context within which we are in, uh, the Kenyan system is a, a, quite a patriarchal society and where a lot of things revolve around the, the patriarchal system. So for example, even um, we've had issues of land being um, inherited along the patriarchal system. But with time, we have seen their changes. And right now, there are changes in our land rights systems where women are also able to land. So I would say that there are things that are changing. And what was we were seeing within the traditional space is right now taking a new, um, a new system. Of course, even when there are still changes that have occurred in policy in relation to how um, maybe um, issues of inheritance of land, but the change still takes time to uh, manifest because of the, uh, the perceptions that still exist, because of the cultural systems that we're still um, uh, operating in. And so 
it takes a bit of time for that cultural change to occur. Um, when we look at um, uh, gender issues right now, I see also we are looking at it a lot from the intersectional perspective because we come to the realization where we realize that not all women are the same, but because of other intersecting factors, then we come across the differences. So the intersectional approach within the gender discourse has, has really come up as one of the aspects on how we are uh, looking at uh, our research and looking at our studies from in development and agriculture from that intersectional perspective. Um, Another thing I've also realized is that uh, even as we are talking about gender, I know there's been the move from the women's studies to the gender development, gender studies. But right now I see that even as we talk about in, uh, gender, gender studies or gender in various uh, um, fields, a lot of it is about women empowerment. And sometimes uh, there's that aspect where then there's the balance in terms of we're doing gender studies, but we, we, we undertake a lot of the women empowerment studies. But this I know is also anchored on the historical aspects on where women have been traditionally and how a lot of the studies on gender are trying to empower women and girls to be able to um, have equal access to resources. That's my take. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we will have Miguel again. Miguel? Yeah, I would like I'd like to to, <clears throat> to take on, on, on Virginia's question about patriarchy. It's a very interesting one because um, I think that there is uh, clearly a, a distinction of, of language um, uh, that is connected with time and and um, theoretical and political approaches, I think that a term like patriarchy, which refers to a power structure, to a system of power, um, equivalent for gender and sexuality to capitalism for the political economy, I think that the use of patriarchy is, is, is something that we hear less and less among the new producers of knowledge that came out in the last 30 years that I was referring to. And those producers of knowledge are social movements and identity groups and, and dynamics in, in civil society and not in academia. And I was on the chat, I wrote to Virginia, yeah, you're right, because I hear more and more people talk about cis heteronormativity much more than patriarchy, for instance. So there seems to be an attention to identity, which is what is implied in cis heteronormativity, at least here in Europe, um, than an attention to patriarchy. You, you, you'll find the word patriarchy used by people like me or by older feminists, right? And then among the younger uh, uh, organized social movements or you know, self-organized groups of, of, of youngsters in the city, you hear cis heteronormativity, right? So this is something interesting for us to look into. And it has to do with the production of knowledge by agents other than academia, I think. And, um, and, uh, and picking up on what Sandra says, which is really, really interesting. Uh, I think that we, not only we need to pay attention to context, which is what, Anthropology is all about is looking at specific cases in order to contribute to universal knowledge about humankind. Uh, we need to include in those contexts of observation and of, of fieldwork, we need to include these social movements and these identity groups as uh, um, interlocutors. And we need to study them. We need to look at them as producers of knowledge and producers of meaning in the same way that we look at a, a community or a group of people uh, as uh, producers of meaning, right? And, and, uh, and, and sort of create, even if it is artificial, create a little bit more distance between us. This is going to sound terribly conservative, okay? Warning. Uh, we maybe need to create a little bit more distance between what we do in academia and our political engagement in social movements. And I, I feel okay saying this because I've been involved, right? But we need to create a little bit more distance and actually start looking at them as producers of meaning like anyone that traditionally anthropologists studied. Yeah, 
So I think that I don't know this. I'm I'm thinking you know uh, on free wheel, but uh, um, but I think this is maybe something we need to reflect about. Yeah, I don't know. Miriam, you're going to say something about this. I know. <laughs> about i think that the, the question uh thank you virginia about your question about patriarchy uh, i agree with miguel uh, that well i was from one generation that we are against uh, the use of patriarchy it was because it was a marxist um, uh, concept that we we don't you didn't use but now all my students all talk about patriarchy and i, I began to use because uh now i understand it's it's uh, there are so many situations, for example, in the university. Uh, now we are in um, uh, the election for the new rector in our university. And the discussion in the politics in, inside the university is so patriarchal that we have to use this, this concept. Then I agree that now we have another way to think about patriarchy. And, and it comes in Brazil a lot from uh, black feminists. Um, the, these new movements then I would like to, to talk of, um, more about, because we are talking now uh, uh, here about Michelle, I think, about, uh, well, uh, all this uh, backlash uh, that is, well, of course, we are in Brazil with Bolsonaro, the right wing, we, I, 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 did, I don't need to explain what you are le uh, feeling now in Brazil, but uh, we are, we, you, you, there's some contradiction because we think, ah, with Bolsonaro, everything will go well. well gender ideology will have a lot of, um, uh, well, attacks on, on our uh, field of work. But it's incredible that we have so many movements now in Brazil and young, uh, old people, uh, black, Indians, uh, people with uh, handicap, well, they're lesbian, uh, well, there are so many trans people, etc. etc. Then we, in Brazil, we saw that we have um, this backlash is in another way. Uh, I think that it, uh, there, but for example, I, I had never so many students in my classes the, after Bolsonaro in the power. There are many, many people who say, I, I never studied uh, gender, but now with Bolsonaro, I, I need to, to, to know what is, what is this gender that they don't like, they want to destroy in the university. That, then I, I think these are important questions. I, would like, I will return in the next time, but I would only uh, like to, to talk about um, gay marriage that we are talking here. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a very strong, well, Miguel work uh, as well in this uh, about this question, but I think this is a really uh, an anthropological question about kinship, and I am not in this uh, this interpretation. We well, in my, in my I have a lot of students. We did a lot of um, research on that in Brazil and here in France, comparative in France, and I I, I don't agree that is a uh, heteronormativity. I think uh, that of course. The family and the uh, the kinship. Um, uh, what we are seeing is not different to be gay, lesbian, trans, and have children or heterosexual. Uh, family now are more or less the same, uh, and uh, I think is a really very important question for us about kinship and family. And uh, I think is a is a a field that you have to return to discuss and to do comparative work about what is happening. Uh, where uh, we are talking Lin, about Asia and China. I would like to know exactly what is happening now with this, this, this new question about family uh, in this moment. Thank you. Well, thank you. I guess uh, Claire is having some little technical difficulties. I guess uh, we will now have a Miriam. I talk, uh, uh, Michelle. Oh, well, sorry, then uh, Huma. Uh, well, I um, in some way I'm actually glad we are we are back to looking at patriarchy because, but also I think we need to um, to um, um, 
make the question of um, patriarchy a little bit more complex now, looking at, at least at, um, in the context of Middle East. And in the past, when we talk about patriarchy, we were focusing mostly on culture, on, on the normative institution and practices. But um, while we talk in the West a little, a little bit about religious um, regressive approaches as a, as, a, as a reaction to feminist, feminist context and women's, women's uh, claiming more power uh, in, in social and family life. Um, in, in a way, this happened in the context of at least Iran, but some of the other Middle Eastern a little bit earlier, but not through a social movement or, or religious movement uh, that is separate from the state. Like with the Iranian revolution, in some way that came back through that regressive approach to uh, to gender equality came back through through state. Now women uh, is not so much just fighting the cultural, the normative cultural practices. It's all it's it's actually going through the state. But question is not so um, so straightforward because at the same time. Um, Iran today has um, more than 60% of all university students are women. Women are highly educated, in fact, in fact one of the most educated group in, in the Middle East, um, and, and women in unconventional positions like that. They are architects, they are engineers, they are, they are doing, they are scientists, and um, so it's not like they're not necessarily in what they used to be called soft. The, some people study both. And at the same time, is I remember the first time when women's studies was introduced in Iran in early 2000. They had room for for 14 uh, candidates. This was a graduate um, course. Out of these 14, 12 were men. Uh, so everybody expected gender women and gender study classes would be full with women, with all the question that is going on. But men were also as in, as much interested in this, and so it was a, this funny situation that in the context of Iran, that uh, women were pushing for gender studies. Then we get a we get a, a, a whole lot of cohort which are primarily male with two two or three women in in the context. All the of course profs are are a female, so. Um, as much as we have advanced, I think we we maybe not just we left women behind, maybe we left patriarchy also behind. So the concept is actually is not sophisticated enough to help us to understand the complexities that are on the ground. So I um, I'm not exactly sure how we can catch up and how we can do it. Um, and the question is. Also, the doing research is not so simple. It's not um, in the context where a state is so much in control of every day from what you wear, where you go, how you speak, and then it will be, and there's no um, freedom of expression, there's no freedom of uh, association except through religion, then it's very difficult for people to do, to conduct research. So, um, and then what what are, what are we going to do as a as an academician? Are we going to leave those little areas as a whole uh, in the middle of our uh, knowledge knowledge creation? Um, are we going to find other ways of doing research? Um, is really doing research through um, interviewing on on digital context would that really replace being on the ground? I mean, those are questions that. I think it's very important for anthropologists to consider, but also to look at more nuanced methodology of doing research, which help us understand the complexities um, of this vast area, uh, vast region that we need to talk. On the other hand, I mean, there are also complex things. We had a movement, say, in Turkey, where women pick up the veil as a resistance to state. Now we have a reverse movement, like a lot of people who are still very religious, but now they're taking off the scarf because they don't see that has got anything to do with um, spirituality and religion that they believed in. So 
but there's not enough um, there's not enough research done on the ground. In fact, journalists do a lot more work than we do, and I think that also influences the way knowledge is created, and the knowledge also recreate knowledge again, right? It's because we use the knowledge created to create more knowledge, and so it's. It is a very complex situation for those of us interested in in um, women and uh, generally in those uh, societies where a state is so strong and they actually use religion when uh, when there's high level of repression and yet we do have um, a move as a, we have a resistance from on the ground so there's a lot of uh, really movement and opposition and trying to change and understand things outside the normative context but at the at the individual level like we have the, a lot most of the movements so in the, especially in the context of iran is actually um common action like women resisting wearing the veil uh, and protesting individually one by one <laughs> rather than having huge um organization because it's uh, there is not possibility so those are those are complex issues that we need to consider and i hope that we can go back to some of the old concepts and re-examine uh, re-examine them again thank you all right thank you very much i'm back i honestly do not know what happened i've been doing these webinars for two years i never had this problem all of a sudden internet was gone and i must say i felt like who <laughs> <laughs> what happened since we've had a lot of hackering here in Portugal lately. So I thought, okay, now the company that I have in my house was hacked. So, okay, I'm back. So thank you very much. I'm sorry I missed part of what Miguel was saying and, and Miriam as well. But I think we've had uh, interventions from everyone in the second round. We had some questions in the chat. Some of them have been addressed already, but I think we can now engage in a more open uh, debate. If anyone from the for anyone that is listening to us wants to intervene or write, they can either write in the chat or uh, ask the questions alive. I, I, I personally have a question, perhaps as a kickoff, since we've been discussing all this different uh, various perspectives on gender and anthropology and what anthropologists do or not do with the issue of gender, sexuality, etc. And I was exactly thinking of something that Sandra touched upon, which is uh, issues of of of, um, of LGBT, etc., and how differently they are approached and even accepted in each country. And I wanted to ask Lynn about the, the special case of, of Japan and China, because as far as I know, these are not easy um, themes. But I also wanted to ask from an academic point of view, what is in academia uh, the perception that people have of colleagues that are that are you know gays or 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 that choose another approach to gender is it what what is the relationship like do beyond besides doing field work on those issues can people openly uh talk is this discussed openly in china and in japan because i think those are very interesting countries or regions to think about these issues yes thank you so uh I, although I'm not a, a China expert, I can say briefly that you know there there has been a sexual revolution in China in the 90s, and that really is backed by the state. And the the idea is that everyone should, if you're anyone, you should be discussing your own sexuality. So the, an explosion of openness in talking about an in, uh, in the enormous range of sexual issues, in, including sexual orientation that has been going on for over 20 years. So um, with that, there's openness. And especially among young people now in, in, um, well, uh, in popular culture, I mean, there's lots of representations of all kinds of sexual orientations. And it's partly coming from Japan, but it's, you know, it, it's out there. On the other hand, in terms of um, formal movements, it's very difficult. And it's especially you, lots of people don't want to be outed. And this is true in Japan as well. So in, from the academic level, um, so there are, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if you mean anthropologists or if you just mean general 
academia, but um, among, um, I'd say uh, certainly there, you know, there are sexuality experts in in, Chi in universities across China, and um, there are gender specialists and people, and they are talking about gender issues, and often they're you know seen as experts, and people go to them for opinions about various sexual and, and gender issues. So I think it's it's pretty openly discussed. Um, on the other hand, it's difficult to come out. Be and the, the main reason it's difficult to come out is because people are concerned about their parents and it's their responsibility to their parents to be straight and to produce children and so on. So in Japan's case, um, I'd say there's also a growing acceptance of different sexual orientations within the universities. There are very few gender specialists. I think th there are um, people who are gender specialists in Japanese universities were not trained as gender specialists. They're trained as economists or sociologists, but then they start publishing on gender. I think it's perfectly fine to discuss it, but people who are doing gender studies, they tell me that they feel they are marginalized within their universities. Um, yeah, I, I see uh, I see Gordon popping up. Maybe he has some comments as well. Uh, maybe I, I'll stop here. No, you know much better than I do. I, I keep quiet. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. So, oops, the sound's here again. Okay, so do we, does anyone from the participants wants to pitch in, in while well, completing whatever the ideas you were uh, getting across or, the, or the discussing something that your fellow colleagues just uh, said about M Miguel raised his hand. So you can either raise your hand like this or you can use the little yellow hand in the, uh -huh. in the chat. So Miguel and Miriam, so let's start with Miguel. He was the first one. Okay, I think I think I would just like to add to what Lynn said uh, and and give in a um, provide the perspective of of what how I see that things are going on in Europe. If you look at Europe as a, as a unit, which of course is very difficult, but but actually, if you look at Europe as a unit nowadays, you can see probably two types of discussion going on that cross each other that are very politicized and that we need to address as anthropologists. Um, the one big divide is the one between this neoconservative or neo-reactionary approach to gender, uh, which can be encapsulated in the, in the uh, notion of gender ideology, which is promoted by the Vatican and then it's subscribed by the Polish government uh, the Russian government, uh, in Hungary also, and basically by populist and right-wing movements uh, all throughout the, the continent. So that's opposed to uh, progressive equal opportunity notions of gender and sexuality based on legislation on abortion, on equal rights for men and women, on same-sex marriage and so on, which have become very mainstream among a very general social democratic approach in Europe, right? I mean, you, you, you can look at Europe as fundamentally a social democratic continent since World War II, and now you have this uh, conservative movement that, that looks at social democracy as conservative. And it says that it's stale, it, it's on a stalemate, that, that it's institutionalized. And so all of the progressive achievements in terms of gender and sexual equality are now seen by the right wing as conservative, old stuff that needs to be overcome. And so this is a big challenge because it's the right wing the, and, and the populists and the demagogues who are actually doing something that sounds revolutionary, okay? That sounds new. And we... Who, who, who protect equal opportunity, same-sex marriage, et cetera, et cetera, we are portrayed as uh, non-innovative, as conservative, as institutional, as government dependent, and so on and so forth. So we need to look at this as a social phenomenon, I think. The other one, which happens in Europe a lot, is uh, internal divisions among 
groups, identities, movements, and even academics who one would be would expect to be on the same side. Okay, and that's that. I'm talking about uh, the way that feminism is challenged by certain uh, uh, movements in the transgender activism, for instance, or the way that uh, uh, lesbian, some sections of the lesbian social movement are opposed to the demands of some sections of the transgender and transsexual movement, for instance, okay? Or the, the divisions between uh, 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 LGBT movements who focus on equal opportunity and equal laws and those LGBT movements, we don't even call themselves LGBT anymore, they will call themselves queer or something like that in order to promote other sorts of, of social transformations based on a critical perspective of gender itself, a critical perspective of sexuality itself, and they go to the radical uh, roots of the concepts that we have been using for decades. And so these, these two movements are incredibly challenging. And I don't think that we as anthropologists who work on gender and sexuality have yet addressed uh, this as an object of study, uh, these types of discussions. I don't think we have done it yet. And um, it's new, it's recent. Uh, it's probably very much contextualized in Europe and, and, and in the Americas. Uh, which is pretty much the same cultural area, so to speak, uh, but, but we, need to, we need to do it because we're leaving that to politicians. We are leaving that to some very good thinkers, but who do not have the ethnographic skills that we have. And I think we need to, to address that, yeah. Thank you very much, Miguel. Miriam? Uh, well, I would, I would like to discuss a little about two questions, one about the question about Adriano uh, here, uh, you, you ask about, well, uh, why men are like enemies for feminism and what anthropology can do with that. And then I, I think it's a, it's a note and a new question about, um, well, cooperation and uh, uh, what kind of, what you can, for what feminism came and what anthropology can uh, do with that. Uh, Adriano, the question is that, uh, I don't think uh, feminism is against men, or, but feminism uh, reflect about masculinity and what is the role of men in our society and a role that is a role of power and domination. I, I think all of us, we need and we do, we do that when we became anthropologists. We have to um, understand that our world vision is one a part of the world, that you are in a, in a, in a place. Then, for example, now I, am, uh, I learn a lot with my students, Black students, Indian students, who put me in the position that I am an old professor and I am white women and they have power and they have uh, well all, all the all the things the power that to be white in brazilian society represents then it's very important for me to understand that yes i am against racism and i i want to change the world and, and I, I i don't want to be a racist but my position my body puts me in a position that I am uh, hierarchical in a other place, then I think is that the question that men, all men in their different position, because all men are not in the same position if they are young, uh, beautiful, uh, um, black uh, from Brazil, from China, from all parts of the world, uh, you have to put yourself in the position of what are the privileges that my position as men have in the relation with women and in, in the, the society where I, I live? Because all of us, we have one position in the university as professors. We have another position in our house as uh, well, in our uh, effective life and in family and so and in the, in the street. Then 
I think the question is not uh, that men are enemies, is that all of us, we have to understand what position of uh, power we have and the position to be a man, to have a man body is a position of power in all societies. Then uh, only for, I, I don't know if I can answer your question, but this, I think you have to understand this position. Well, I can uh, talk a little, very quickly about, well, Europe and all the negationism and the right wing. Here I'm now in France and, and, I, and I'm accompanying the French uh, election. It is, well, for example, Marine Le Pen, who was, well, the right uh, wing, very uh, conservative. Now she's feminist. All his discourse is a, is, is a feminist discourse. Then it's incredible that the, the way that the why the, the that the conservative are transforming. We have now here in France, Marie Le Pen, Precres, Valérie Precres is from someone. The two, two of them, they are um, and fighting and showing that they are being um, denigrated in the media because they are women. And, and in the, in the, it is really very interesting to understand that they, they use our discourse for a new, posi a new political position. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, for that. I don't know if Adriano wants to add something to what he wrote in the chat. You can speak if you want. Adriano, we cannot see you. No, he's, he's, he, doesn't, he doesn't acknowledge. I don't know if he listens to that. OK, but OK, if Adriano, Adriano, if you want to add anything there to what, what you wrote in the chat and what Miriam just commented on, please feel free to do it. Just come up with your image and your sound. OK, so anyone else has a comments on the things that were being discussed, either the guests or other participants? Please feel free to intervene. May I? Yes, please, Sandra. OK. Uh, maybe I wanted, I wanted to go back to the discussion on movements and science. Uh, and and, and I, I, I confess that too often it gets puzzling. I do understand that we do live in a scenario where we, based on the production of knowledge that we do, we identify uh, injustice and unfairness and all of it. And, and we can respond to becoming activists, to becoming part of movement, to defending uh, the injustice, uh, to fight against the injustice that we do identify. However, it feels to me that too often those two positions get extremely blurred and it becomes difficult to then approach to do research with neutral, as neutral as we can be. So um, I'm a lecturer and I do teach first year students about what is science? What, what is it to be a scientist? And what are, how science is about methodology and how you should be precise and you have to explain and give us evidence for all the details of in order to build a conclusion. Now, if we so ingrained into those movements, don't we run the risk of then uh, lowering our levels of um, methodology acuteness in the productions that we do? Can we simultaneously be researchers and activists and simultaneously being the knowledge production as an exercise while being um, part of a movement that has a cause that in a way has a response, has already identified what it's wrong or right. However, we as scientists are looking for answers to make reality intelligible. So this is for me a dilemma. And I don't know, maybe I'd like to hear from you I mean, like in the field and how to deal with it in contemporary times. Thank you. 
Oh, uh, Sandra, thank you so much. We have another question in the chat, but I don't know if anyone from the speakers wants to react to what Sandra was saying or someone else. Did anyone raise their hand? Uh, Miguel and Miriam, no. Yeah, Miguel? I, I would love to because because it's up my alley, because I've been involved in that. I think it's very difficult to solve, Sandra. I think that um, the type of knowledge that we produce in anthropology is knowledge built with others. I mean, it's not knowledge from the academia. It's sort of knowledge that comes from the field and the, the theories from academia meet the theories on the field and you produce a third type of knowledge. So it's not really science what we do, I think. Uh, we do something else. I don't know what to call it. Um, that's my perspective. Uh, however, I think we have a scientific method and we should apply it when we cooperate with social movements. So the, the deal, the negotiation is, okay, I work with you, but I will be very blunt and very critical uh, about what you do. And you can be very blunt and very critical about what you feel are the parti uh, pris, the prejudices in, 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 in scientific convention. Okay, so it works both ways because many times social move, movements feel that academia has this canonical way of thinking that is not in tune with people's interests and, and expectations. And we in academia, we, are, we have to be critical and skeptical about the creation of ideologies wherever they are, including social movements. So if both parties accept that there's going to be a dance that is not always nice uh, between the two methodologies, so to speak, then we can produce something interesting, temporary, uh, some sort of knowledge that is temporary, that is ongoing in time. Um, but, um, but other than that, no, other than that, you have to choose. Okay, either you totally participate in the social movement and you, you know, you don't pay attention to academia or you, you stay in the ivory tower and you don't pay attention to social movements. But if you want to get your hands dirty in reality, it's very, very difficult. Yes, it is. It's very frustrating. It's very challenging. And you need to constantly remind yourself and the others that you are on different professional positions on different perspectives you're using different tools uh, you're going to get at different conclusions uh, when when both parties accept that uh, it, it it is very interesting and it can produce something new uh, most times it doesn't most times it's really complicated yeah so I understand your but I've I've, I've done that before and 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 I think that um, there isn't a, a ready-made a ready-made solution. But even if you think about other, other um, more scientific practices, uh, for instance, some areas in, 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 in life sciences that then are involved with social movements that have to do, for instance, with climate change or with something like that, uh, they have the same problems. They, they, they have exactly the same problems. Um, so uh, they are methodological and they are problems of authenticity in what you do and, and honesty, right? And so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I took too, much, too long, but it's, it's something that really, really interests me. And I mean, and we, we, you know, it will be interesting to talk about this in the future no, it, on it, a it, webinar think, on that. Yeah, I think it's very interesting, the, the, the mixing of you as anthropologists and you as activists. And, act, and, and of course, Miguel can talk about that very well since he was in parliament to defend um, gay marriage, etc., and so can Homa, who was in prison because of her feminism. So I think <clears throat> these are two of our guests that really felt in the skin what it is like to be in the not in the field, but in reality, in real life, and not being not being an anthropologist thinking about it, but really working with civil society or in civil society. So, okay, we have several other questions. I don't know if we'll have time for all of them, but Zerihum uh, asked here. There is the assumption that gender inequality and conflict dash violence often or may correspond. I think there's a lack of a word here, but does gender equality necessarily result in peace? That's his question. And then we have uh, Danielle who wants to ask something. And of course you are all more than welcome to um, 
to, to talk a life. I mean, we, we do have the guests, but then this is a, a, an open debate. Everybody can talk. I don't know if Miriam wanted to talk because I remember you raised, you raised your hand, didn't you? No, okay. So uh, does anyone want to address uh, Zeri Holmes' question about the, I read it, but now I lost it. Just one second, please. Oh yeah, about the assumption that gender inequality and conflict violence may or may not correspond. Does gender equality necessarily result in peace? I would say not. Oh, <laughs> unfortunately, if all the problems in the world will solve with that, with gender equality, but I don't know if anyone wants to pitch in. Or if you want to give it a, give it, give it a second to think about it. Homa, Homa, please. Yeah, I, um, of, of course, naturally, that's a question that is very much on my mind, but it depends how we do define peace. Peace is not just given, like it's a, whether you mean is a silence of gun or silence of um, people accepting what, the 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 uh, the situation that they are put in well that's different you can silence um you can silence uh, a lot of injustices as well and the, there won't be any gun but in order to have a meaningful peace where people can fulfill their potential and feel they have they are comfortable in their skin in their society then yes, I think you need to have some kind of justice and fairness. It may not be defined by, um, by uh, gender equality as the way we know it today, but I think um, before we can actually um, find an answer to this question, we need to, to see what, what do we mean, what kind of peace. Peace has got different gradation and you can then, but if you want a full, uh, a society that it, uh, feels fulfilled and they can achieve their potential. I think you, you need to have social justice. And although justice also is a, a, is a contextualized, but, but I, I think within that, within whatever society uh, context we are looking there, when people feel there's uh, injustice, it cannot be a, a real peace as, as I can, I can see that. So I think definition of peace is more important than definition of uh, gender justice in this situation. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Homa. Uh, Danielle, you had a question, please. Hi, can you listen to me? Listen to me, it's okay. Uh, my question is more for Miriam and Miguel because like, uh, Portuguese question is because the Portuguese language. I'm from Brazil and it's talking about with Sandra. Sandra brought up this, the question of the production of science and that activism that Miguel talked about. And Miriam talked about the, the, the man in the feminism, the, the question of the man in feminism, how to do this. Né? But in Portuguese, I'm a masculine student from UNESP in Brazil. And when we are studying masculinity in Brazil, it's a little hard to talk about the masculinity because the expression to talk about the inequality of gender, we have the expression machism, machismo. It's the expression we use. We have the word sexism, that is the word. Né? But it's, sometimes I, I find it hard to try to use the word machismo because the implication, of course, the men, it's in a super uh, a hierarchy. We know that, the power of the men. But it's like the woman can't reproduce. And sexism is, like, is more like a, a better word, like uh, racism. We don't say just white supremacy, we say ra racism. So we use sexism. But in Portuguese, in the, in the community and academy, we use the machismo. So all the fault is in the men. So it's, it's hard to say that Women can reproduce the masculine power, can reproduce mothers, can reproduce this power. So how to, how we do this? Because like we produce in the academy, I don't like to, to use the word machismo, I prefer the sexism or sexism, but it's, it's, I don't know in the other language because they speak that, that two languages. So it's a little hard to speak about something that you put in just one, one, one side. I know that it's uh, beneficial for the men, like racism. We know there's benefits for white, it's white supremacy. We understand that. But when you put like a bipolar word, it's hard to, 
talk about and to talk about the the profound like I get hard to say the word like how deep is the question of gender? It's so deep that it's in the, all societies, not just a main uh, this masculine thing. It's a feminist thing because the masculine study starts with the feminists. The feminists who start to think about gender and gender starts being a thing and men start thinking. I think, I hope I make myself clear. I'm a little nervous, but thanks. Does anyone want to address? Uh, yeah, Miriam, was, Miriam was, was suggesting that I said something about it because of the masculinity side. Uh, now, I think uh, that's a very interesting point, but I think that uh, machismo, don't confuse it with the American Express and machismo, which is connected with a sort of more ethnic definition for you know Spanish speaking uh, cultures. But in Portuguese, we use machismo comes from the field. I mean, it's a namic concept. Uh, it's actually something that we don't invent in academia that we don't really use unless it comes from the field. It's in the field, it's in society, it's uh, uh, at the emic level that, for instance, in Portuguese society, you hear people talk about machismo. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a category that is used in, in, in everyday life, in senso comum, like we say in Portuguese, right? Um, and then it can be transported into the academia as a good ethnographic tool, as something that we are using to talk about how people talk about sexism. So in a way, the problem is solved this way, okay? So, but then of course, when we talk about uh, uh, sexism, we tend, I mean, at least here, we tend to, to, to resort to sexism and we would only use the expression machismo uh, if it is in the mouth of an interlocutor in the field. Yeah, as, as a popular category, yeah. Which is very significant in itself, yeah. Uh, it is, it is, it is uh, a, a critical category that is used by people in everyday life to accuse and criticize forms of male sexism, yeah, and of male supremacy and male self-aggrandizement, yeah. Uh, thank you, Miguel. Okay, we have a question here from H, H or HP, I don't know who HP is. But it says, um, it, it's better if in the chat you, you identify yourself and where you're from. I don't know who H is, but it says something like, uh, since um, in this freedom, there's the disappearing of the patriarchy traditional image, we notice the deterioration of traditional family due to gender equality and rights. Do you think freedom and gender equality led some to behave foolishly without paying attention to their children and the dangerous surrounding a child during his or her early childhood that may be exploited by gangs of human trafficking or terrorism, especially in the Middle East? I, I don't know if I understand this question. You're, you're saying that the deterioration of traditional families due to gender equality and rights, and that makes people um, pay less attention to their children. Is that what you mean? I, I don't know. I don't know if the person who stated this question and calls him or herself HP wants to expand on this or if anyone wants to comment. It's in the chat. I'm not a. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this comment or on this question. Homa? Yeah, I. Actually, I, I would like to comment on this in part because I do hear this a lot um, amongst the more um, traditional, but especially in the Middle East. Now, suddenly we have a lot more divorce because, um, because of the gender equality, because women want to be something else than, than their mother, the mother of the husband was. And, and so the blame is all on women rather than like the debate, we can also say, well, if you're so careful and you're caring about children uh, and what is happening, why don't we make the family a more democratic institution? The reason many women want to get divorced is because those institutions are not, not democratic. They're not just, they're not peaceful. 
so this claim that women have to put up with a lot of suffering in order to take care of children is firstly unjust to women, but it's also unjust to, um, to children. When you live in households that are undemocratic, that are full of tension and uh, violence, um, whether it's a passive aggressive violence or um, a physical violence, which is often the case, those children are not going to be protected just because they are, they are in, as they say, in, a, in an intact family household. It doesn't make them safer. Sometimes, in fact, children are much safer to be outside those households. I think this concept that family is necessarily safe and full of love is, is a mis, misconcept. And I think it is our duty as an anthropologist to actually bring that to the public. This ideology, that's ideology of family, uh, a loving family that is good for everybody is actually par part of the patriarchal myth rather than a reality on the ground. So uh, whatever HP meant with, with this question, I, I'm glad I, got, <laughs> I get a chance to talk about this undemocratic institution that we all want to uh, hurry up and protect it when it is in fact bad. It's in fact even bad for the men. But anyway, I stop here. Well, th there there is actually an answer from HP uh, on the chat, but I think yeah, uh, it, uh, this person is talking about very strict notions of a family, <laughs> and we are trying. I think we, as anthropologists, um, acknowledge the the variety of, of families that of types of families that can have that can exist. And I think, I think Homer answered quite correctly on this. You know, that you're thinking of family as an institution in one model of family, which is not necessarily the only one or the what is correct, what is the correct family? What is the, you know, as you call it, you say, why to blame institutions since it's a responsibility of men and women? Well, it's, the, I think it's the responsibility of everyone, isn't it? I don't know if anyone else wants to address this or. Um... We also have some I'm comments just... from Francesca, but that's comments on things that were already discussed. So who, who was, uh, Miriam, were you talking or Salome? It's Salome. Now, I just want to, um, yes, just to talk way in on what Homer was talking about. Uh, for example, here in Kenya, when you're doing gender-related uh, activities, when you go to different uh, offices or different uh, fora, and you talk about, oh, we want to do a gender study or a gender intervention, many times the default will be that, oh, you're the ones who want to make our women to be hard-headed and, you know, to rebel against men. I think it comes from maybe um, misconceptions about what gender is, and also maybe the entry in which sometimes how gender issues and feminist studies came into um, the country that made maybe people look at it more like it's being championed by people who maybe are not married and not in family setups. And so the perception came out that any gender study is to destroy families, which is not the case. So it's just an aspect of understanding exactly what gender is. And uh, once you implement it well, then it's able to bring about equality and equity within um, access to resources and services. Thank you. Exactly, Salome, thank you so much. Well, uh, everyone, we are coming to an end because we're all, we've been here almost two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, I don't see any more. Um, well, we have Francesca's question. I don't know if we want to finish with that one. Uh, Francesca, are you there? Do you want to speak up uh, or do you prefer that I read the question? Okay. So Francesca was saying, I think that what Sandra said about local decolonized production of knowledge is an interesting concept. What about in terms of gender? I wonder if matrilineal societies, several are here in Mozambique, can talk to this urge. So I don't know if Sandra wants to comment on this to finish up and we'll wrap up. Sure. Um, indeed, uh, th th there's a huge discussion about um, uh, being 
not necessarily uh, um, yes matrilineal societies, but the, which uh, do not necessarily locate power into women, um, even though they are um, um, heritage and so on follows through the line of women. It's through uh, men in those uh, families. So. Um, going back to the concept of patriarchy, it seems that um, power still uh, is held by, by men. But th th there are, uh, and I think that's the beauty of anthropology that we go into details and we look at everyday dynamics at small um, insights and how people understand and live. And there are so many rich material that can be brought up to, to show in which contexts uh, power indeed is negotiated and uh, how women and men in, and in, in certain circumstances do have the ability to uh, engage in a more equal uh, and equitable uh, manner. So much of my research is really towards trying to bring up this kind of dynamics and, and you use these examples to engage with concepts that are already um, established and try to challenge them and see what can we make of it. Those are stories that have not been told yet. So let's tell the stories, give these narratives and see what we can do and enlarge our understandings and the concepts that we use even in gender studies. So indeed, there's space for it. <laughs> All right, Sanders, thank you so much. So I think that we should end now. We've been here two hours. I, I know there's always more questions and more debate, uh, but well, uh, two hours is a long time for people on Zoom and uh, looking at screens. So uh, as I said, uh, the video will be posted on the WCA WOW website, not today, but within the next few days. So uh, you can tell anyone that has not been had the opportunity to be here live that they can watch it. And uh, I want to thank very, very much to all the guests and presenters and also to everyone who was here. It was a very fruitful discussion and I'm sure, well, it, it, it will be an endless debate because as we saw, uh, there's so many facets, so many sides to it. But well, thank you very much and hope to see you soon. Well, probably, within two months in the next um, WCA webinar. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. And thank you once again. <laughs>